enjoyable holiday break, be sure to make plans to join us on Thursday, January 25th, this Thursday coming up, in the Education Building Basement 001 for the part one of the Better You series. It'll be from 5.30 to 7 p.m. Come receive valuable information regarding your physical and sexual health and dinner will be provided. Monday night, February 5th, will be the first student success study session of the semester. Join uh, us in Go Call 101 for an opportunity to join to study together in discipline specific groups and receive additional academic assistance. The session is from 6 to 8 p.m. Pizza will be provided. Please RSVP. On Tuesday, February 6th, there is an opportunity for those interested in pursuing careers in business, going to law school, or to graduate school to gain more information. The Business Law and Graduate School Informational will be held in the Education Building basement from 5.30 to 7 p.m. Again, it is important that you RSVP if you plan on attending. Next Wednesday, February 7th, is Utilizing and Maximizing Library Resources Workshop from 5.30 7 p.m. in the library room 309. Attendees will learn of the various resources that are available through the library. A scavenger hunt will also be a part of the event. Dinner will be provided. If you have moved, changed your major or contact number, please log into my.mentortech.ttu.edu to update your information. It is very important that this information is current. The proper use of a time management system is proven to increase productivity and efficiency. Mentor Tech still has a limited number of free plans available. If you didn't receive a plan last semester, stop by Go Call Room 104. Remember, mentors and protégés are required to maintain weekly contact with a minimum of two face-to-face -face interactions per month. Please notify your PAC member, Mentor Tech, or office if you're having difficulty making contact. Protégés are required to attend a minimum of three academic and one social event per semester. Please contact the office in advance if you have conflicts that will prohibit you from meeting this requirement. All protégés who will graduate in May, August, or December of this year must contact the Mentor Tech office immediately in order to be included in the graduates' recognition portion of the celebration banquet in April. Tonight, our presenters are Mr. Joshua Berry, Director of Success and Retention, and Ms. Elvia Cesares, Assistant Director of Stakeholder Support. Both of them are part of the University's Student Success and Retention Initiative. They will provide us with a valuable information designed to remind us of strategies and available resources that, resource that will help us to maximize our study time and reach our academic goals for the semester. Let's welcome them at this time. Well, I was going to be here with me, but she's not. I apologize because she's definitely the more exciting of the two of us. She's got way more. Um, she's doing a little bit as close to mine. So thank you all for the warm welcome. Um, my name is Joshua Barron, and uh, I'm the director for Student Success and Retention, like I already said. And you are the few faithful who are committed to your own success and making the grade, right? So the coolest part is that I'm going to give you information tonight um, that. A lot of it, you'll look at it and you'll say, you know, I'm not sure that that is anything I didn't know already, but I suspect that I'm going to bring you through a process by which that um, we can help you actually make the grade easier, faster, um, and more often than uh, the students who aren't using these kinds of strategies. So, um, I, um, I'm so committed to, um, to that as an outcome for you that I'm hoping that you will uh, uh, do some inventory of how you did last semester and then how that changes as you use these strategies this semester, all right? So why should you listen to me is the big question, right? Why, well, I mean, so I've got a graduate degree, yay, so I work in this environment, yay, but I borrowed these numbers from a friend of mine who uh, is a professor of chemistry and she does this, uh, process with some of her students and at LSU. And um, uh, her name is Avery Yancey McGuire, and you'll love her. She's coming to, uh, to campus in February, and I sure hope that you guys will um, consider going to one of the presentations that she does. It's, she's a really fantastic person. But she shared some information that um, before this type of presentation, she had some students 
um, in chemistry class, or in general chemistry class, um, who made 47.52, and then after coming to this presentation, and where she essentially presented the same type of information that I'm going to give you, the same basic strategies, these are things that are tried and true, the research shows that this stuff matters, and not just the research in general, but specifically this student, then after putting into place these strategies that I'm presenting, made an 82 and an 86 on the next, four, on the next two tests. Um, and ultimately made a B in the class. Some of you are like, B in general chemistry, not bad. Well, her advanced chemistry, um, I'm sorry, the, uh, I'm sorry, that was psychology. Chemistry had way more grades. 90 was the final, made an A in the course after the first three tests, right? Now, I don't know about you, but either Joshua, who happens to be my favorite name, of course, you know, like you shouldn't talk over really. Um, either Joshua started cheating, or Joshua started doing something way different between these, the third test, and I mean, look at that, 68, 50, 50, and then ultimately pulled an A in the class. Now, how many of you are thinking, okay, there's that one class I'm just no good at, fill in the blank. You? What's your, shout it out, what's your I'm no good at? Chemistry. Chemistry, okay, well, there you go. Okay, so there's hope for you, right? <laughs> Stats, fair enough. Sociology, okay, a little more of the people skill stuff. Who else? Modern digital systems. Modern digital systems. Oh, or engineering. Mm -hmm. What else? Thermodynamics. Thermodynamics. Okay, well, so here's the good news. No matter whether it's thermodynamics or digital systems or sociology or English or math or um, chemistry, the stuff that I'm going to present to you today is applicable in all of these environments. And actually, it will even matter as you move beyond the university environment whenever you're in the world of work, and there's something really important that you want to do, and you want to do it well. As a matter of fact, I've used these strategies in order to be able to present this information to you and be confident about it. So I'm a first-hand believer that this stuff actually works. And data and physics, I mean, thermodynamics, physics, okay, so we can at least say that we're studying the same level of kind of science, right? So in each of these environments, whether it's more the social sciences or whether it's more the, the hard STEM sciences, um, you're going to see that if you implement these strategies, then there's a really good chance that you're going to be much better. So let's talk about metacognition. Metacognition, what is that? Thinking Anybody, about good it. guess. Thinking about thinking. Thinking about, who was that? That was me. Oh, that was Les. Sorry. Thinking about thinking, okay. <laughs> so let's write, thanks for like, spoiling my, my spoiler there. Okay. All right, okay, so meta. Metadata is data about the web page that you're gonna look at, right? So when it was created, who wrote it, what institutions were part of. Um, meta, is one of those words where you think about metamorphosis, it's a change that changes the kind of thing that it is from being a chrysalis, um, from being a caterpillar to being a chrysalis to actually being a butterfly. Like it's not just change, it's, it's big time change, right? Metacognition is an overarching thinking. Cognition is thinking, right? Let's think about it. Metacognition is how are we thinking? Metacognition says, I'm gonna back up for a minute and I'm gonna have an out of body experience and look at me and go, Dude, you're wearing that? Are you serious? Like, who wear? Who does that? That's not okay. No. Oh my goodness, the fly is down, right? You're presenting in front of people and you forgot to check your metacognition is looking at yourself and thinking about how you're thinking outside the box. Okay? Now you do this whenever you leave, you go on a date, you check yourself in the mirror, you make a TV, you do a little bit of that. And like, it's an analysis of self, right? But metacognition would be, what do I need to check before I leave for that day? What is it that I need to look at? Why would I need to look at that? Am I anticipating breathing in someone's face closely? Hmm. <laughs> now, I mean, if you're not anticipating, if you're going on a date and you're not anticipating and breathing in somebody's face, then you don't need to check your breath, do you? If you never smile very big, then don't, you don't need to check your teeth, do you? If you don't stand in front of people where they might actually look at your pants, then it's not necessary for you to check your crotch and make sure that you have zipped up your pants in all of the way, is it? But if you are going to do those things, then you have to stop and think. What are the kinds of things that I might need to do in order to set myself up for success? And you define success however you want to, but I define it as not having someone be offended whenever I breathe in their face before I leave them for a kiss. 
And seeing as how I've been married almost 20 years, I'm just telling you that that's very important. Right? So, metacognition is about, whenever you think about learning, is trying to figure out what does it mean to study, right? I mean, like, everybody says, study. Well, did you tell them about this? Did you tell them this? Did you tell them this? No, I just told them how to study. Okay, so maybe, maybe we need to think a little bit differently about what it is to study if we actually want to do it better, smarter, faster, more efficiently, and more effectively. Anybody like wasting their time? No. So are you in on this? Okay, if you're in on this, then you might want to think about taking some notes because you might want to use some of this later. What is the difference between studying and learning? What is the difference between studying and learning? Okay, so I say that one more time. So she said learning is trying to understand it, and studying is is just trying to retain it. Anybody agree? Fair enough. Anybody want to expand on that? What's an example of a time that you studied something intently? What? Finals. I'm sorry. Finals. finals. Finals, you were studying something intently. You were cramming for finals last semester, right? Okay, why were you so, like, frantically investing in finals? So what she said, tell me now. Fabiola? Yeah. Uh, Fabiola says that it's maybe just you want to make that grade and the pressure to make the grade is the thing that's so important, but what you really want to do, like probably learning, would be something more than just getting the grade. It would actually be learning the material, right? Because let me just tell you how many people care about your GPA after you get your first job. Nobody. Nobody cares about whether you got an A in thermodynamics or not. What they care about is can you handle thermodynamics whenever you are engineering the wing of that new plane? Because that's going to matter as you move that aluminum material through the various levels of the atmosphere and the temperature changes and you're going at a particular speed. And what is, it, what, is, what is the friction with air? What kind of effect is that going to have on that new metal that you said would be awesome but all of a sudden begins to contort as it's carrying me through the air over the Atlantic Ocean in a windstorm. I care. I care that you know about it. I care that you know a lot about where my internal organs are placed as you begin to cut on me to do a liver biopsy. Doctor, I don't want you to have gotten an easy A in Dr. Jeannie's biology class or in somebody else's anatomy and physiology class. I don't want it to have been easy. I want it to have been hard. I want it to be damn hard. I want it to be so hard that you come at me with that scalpel and you look at me and you go, huh, I got this. Whenever I went in for a liver biopsy, the doctor looked at me and went, hmm. And then he thumped on my chest and said, hmm. And then he leaned down and thumped a little bit more and thumped a little bit more, and then felt of my ribs, and said, here, and then marked it with a marker. And I have to tell you, that there was part of me that said, are you going to do like an ultrasound or something to make sure that you're like hitting exactly, I mean, are you going to do an x-ray, are you going to have like some robot that's telling you, are you going to, and he was so confident that he said, no. And I went, oh, <laughs> great, well, it's a good thing I'm going to be under, <laughs> right? But he had studied so much that he understood the body so well and he had practiced so intently and so cared so much about the work that he did that he knew my body just from looking at me. And then he tested what he look, his look of my, of, of my torso and he listened to the sound. And he knew the sound of the liver as opposed to another thing. And he knew the sound of the edge of the liver. Now that's a big deal because your liver is not a bad thing to, to keep, right? Okay. So the thing about it is, what's your intent? Is it just the A? Right? Sometimes we get that kind of in the windshield. Oh dear Lord, let me make an A. Like, oh, I gotta, you know, I gotta get there. And then and you're driving like like the Indy 500. You know, I mean like you're like in a race car and you just you've got to find the finish line. You just gotta get the A. I just gotta get it, I just gotta get it. And then sometimes we lose sight of 
actually learning the material because it might actually matter. Sometimes we take a class and we think, you know what, I'm taking this because it's just for some of the basics. Right? I just got to do it. I got to get it over with. No, 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 no. You get to. Remember, it's the difference between the I have to and I get to. There are people in the world who don't eat tonight, and you got pizza. What? You paid for that pizza. Tuition. Right? Fees. That money comes back to you. I paid for that pizza. Taxes. You're welcome. <laughs> but you get to come and you get to learn in these classes. You get the opportunity to grow and invest yourself in you. Why would you settle for just having a piece of paper on the wall in a frame? You can print one of those off if you're good at Photoshop. You need something more than that, right? We don't want to be suits. Right? We want to, like the TV show where the guy like makes the laundry or whatever, or unless you have that photographic memory, please don't be that. What you want to be is the person who's really invested in learning so that whenever you walk out of this place, you can actually make an impact based on the extra information that you know. You can change yourself. You can change the people who are close to you. You can change the world. Yeah? All right. You think you actually can? Well, what about this question? Which one would make you work harder? A or B? Why? Why is B going to make you work harder? What's the pressure? Well, you don't have to. I mean, you could just get up and be like, two plus two is seven. <laughs> and with confidence, it's all about how you deliver it, right? Well, okay. So maybe, for which of the tests would you work harder? A, to make an A on the test, or B, to teach the correct material? To the class. There's more pressure. Why is there more pressure? What's the pressure in the teaching aspect? So there's pressure to help them, but is there a little bit of pressure like to not make a fool of yourself? I mean, come on, like nobody, I mean it's a little bit like you know, Facebook or Instagram or the right kind of snap where you're like, you're taking that snap, right? You did, like you did a selfie like six ways and you go like, that's what it is. Okay, that right there, ready? And Snapchat that. Really? Oh no, look, oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there's that, you don't want people to look at you and be like, <laughs> you want to look at you and be like, oh, ooh, yeah. Wow. Right? So there's a little bit of performance anxiety around that. So what would it look like if Part of your study process was to look at what it was that you were studying, and even if you're not ever going to test to, to teach someone, what if you approached it as if you had to? What if you stood back and looked in on it and said, you know what? I'm going to have to teach this to somebody. What would that do? I just ran somebody off my place. I'm filming somebody. So here's the thing, if we're going to actually do just to make the grade, but if we're going to do make the grade with metacognition, then what we want to do is to stay in learn mode, not just study mode, not that whole like, oh, i got to get this done so I can count this off my test list, i got to finish this homework so that I can be done with my homework, no, no, no. You want to like go back to that homework again to make sure that you got it so that you could have taught the most important person there, who's the most important person there right now? I mean... Oh, please. <laughs> you really think you're the most important person in the room as a teacher? Then we need to talk about self-image, okay, self-concept. You're the most important person in the room. You don't, if you're not successful in that biology class, you know how much it's going to break the heart of that biology teacher? I mean, they really don't like it very much. I know Dr. Dini personally, and, and he really gets upset whenever people don't do well in his class, whenever he works so hard to give them every bit of the material so that they can. It really upsets him personally. But he's not going to make the class any easier because he knows that he's preparing the person who's going to come in my liver with another scalpel. Right? And, and quite frankly, I want him to not be any easier on you in his biology class if you're going to hold a scalpel against my body. You know what I'm saying? So, what does it look like to study if you're going to teach the material and not just make an A on the test? What does it look like? So if you're going to use metacognition, you're going to think about thinking. You're going to be consciously aware of yourself as the problem solver. 
So you have to approach it as if, like, this is your work. This is your job. You're the most important person in the room. Well, sometimes people act as if the most important person in the room is the teacher. In a work environment, a lot of times we act as if the most important person in the room is your boss. Have you ever been in a situation like that where your boss is coming at you because you so value the income that you're making from that job? They walk in and they say, you're going to have to work extra hours tonight. Right? And you go, oh, okay. Or they're gonna, I need that report by 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. So you stay up all night crunching it. Now, maybe that's not the environment that you've been in, but I've been in the work, work, work world since 1996, like after school. And I mean, I'm old, and I've got a lot of years of experience, and I've worked lots of 60-hour work weeks because I really, really, really want to be really, really good at what I'm doing. I really, really want to be the best. I want to walk into a room and know more information than anybody else in there so that whenever somebody says, so what do you think about that, Joshua? I say, um, um, I don't know. I don't know. Because that's what I want to look like in a, in a meeting, right? Is that how you want to look at a meeting? No, I want to be the person that whenever they say, so what do you think about that, Joshua? I say, well, that's one of three good alternatives. But considering what the data says about this, this, and this, and what the research says about that, I would rather recommend this or this. Although there is this third option that we can consider as well. But you should also look at the costs and the benefits of those different things. And the people around the table go, I want them to say, damn. Isn't that how you want people to interact with you when you walk into a room, whenever you go to play a basketball game, whenever you do anything? You want people to be like, and you want to go home at the end of the day and look at yourself in the mirror and be like, don't you? Did you show up here at Texas Tech University thinking, I'm just going to see what I can do to slide by? I'm going to grab that job, that lowest paying job that I can get whenever I graduate. I'm going to find the, the most decent looking, average kind of person that is going to spend the rest of their life with me. I'm going to have some pretty mediocre kids. <laughs> you know, I'm going to live in an like, okay retirement home. You know, I'm going to like brush my teeth sometimes so that I can keep some of them before they fall, you know, the rest of them fall out. I mean, is that kind of like how you woke up today thinking, oh, that's what I'm going to do. It's kind of like that. But, you know, sometimes because we don't set goals, because we don't think about thinking specifically, because we don't look at the way that we're doing what we're doing, sometimes we actually set ourselves up by default to just kind of do that kind of middle of the road. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? I don't know. How was your day, son? I asked my 15-year-old. He goes, okay. <laughs> or he'll say, fine. And I look at him, and I growl. <laughs> and he goes, right, right, right. Okay, so it was pretty decent overall. Um, whenever I was swimming, I actually did some passing people in my lane, and like I was feeling pretty good about that. And um, the butterfly is still pretty hard for me, but uh, and my saxophone, I'm getting way better on that. And I'm like, oh yeah, I, I know, I hear every time I practice. You know, I mean that, right? And he is getting better. He's like investing himself because he wants to be a performer. He wants to perform at the pool whenever he's swimming. He did this whole deal in the Cuban Missile Crisis, and. He did this presentation, and he asked me to print it out of the architecture building so that it could be the coolest looking presentation up there. Like, he's thinking about, like, what's going to win? I don't just want to make the grade, I want to win. And I'm like, who? Who made you so competitive? And he's like, I wonder. And I'm like, it's your mother. If you guys can be consciously aware of yourselves as problem solvers, think about what, figuring out what the problem is. What's the problem you're trying to solve? What's the problem that the professor, instructor, boss, etc is bringing to you what's the thing that you need to do to not just survive but to thrive because there's an enormous difference isn't there what does it look like to monitor and control your own mental processing i suck at chemistry oh i hate math i'm just terrible at english this sociology thing doesn't matter anyhow it's just one of the basics that i have to make it through before i can go into my engineering degree have you ever heard people say that stuff? Have you ever said that stuff? So the first thing you have to do is stop. You have to stop saying that stuff. You have to stop saying, why do I need to learn to tie my shoes? So you don't flip and trip as you run the race. Okay? Like, that's why you learn the basics. That's why. Because critical thinking and logical reasoning and persuasive communication skills are some of the most challenging things that people do. And we don't 
know how to teach that. And like, we're going to teach you how to think logically like today, okay? We're going to think you teach you how to how to uh, reason logically today, think critically today, or persuasively communicate. Now we do approach the persuasive communication sometimes and tell you what are some effective ways. And we do approach the logical processes by examining what logic looks like, certainly. And we do look at critical thinking by examining different kinds of outcomes. And we help come uh, up with models so that you can do that on your own. And there are even classes about all three of those topics, but those are things that you learn in every class. Those are things that you learn in every experience. Those are things that you have the opportunity to do in every interaction, whether it's in the academic environment or beyond. Whenever you control your own mental processing, you're going to do things like, um, there's this, uh, this uh, author, her name is um, Mel Robbins, I think. And um, she talks about the five second rule, and she did a whole lot of uh, study with psychologists and um, uh, uh, neurological scientists, and uh, where they were looking at like what causes, what causes people to resist change. Why do you resist change? And, and basically because our brains are kind of hardwired to resist change. If something has been successful, then your brain says, you want to do it different? Why? And so whenever somebody says, oh, you need to do things a little bit differently, then we tend to avoid that. We resist it. We push away from it. And one of the things that you um, have to do is begin to re recognize that if you don't do something, then you're going to just do the thing that you've always done, or you're going to do nothing. And this makes you a victim in your own life. How many of you woke up today thinking, I want to be a victim? Please victimize me. Somebody take advantage of me, abuse me, use me, do me wrong. Please? Anybody? Come on. I'm here. Target right here. Big bullseye. Is that how you started out today? But what she writes in the book is actually that you did start out that way today unless you specifically plan how it is that you're not going to be a victim. That you specifically decide how you're going to be victorious in challenging situations. You specifically and aggressively pursue strategies for, I'm going to win, I'm going to win, I'm going to win. And you know what? You won't win all the time. But if you win more often than you lose, then maybe that was a really good strategy and effort, wasn't it? And so that's what this is talking about in terms of monitoring and controlling your own processing. I'm terrible at English. No. No, no, no. The challenge for you is to begin to think, I have been terrible at English. You hear the difference? I have been. Now, I'm not going to be anymore because I'm bound and determined to win. <laughs> and as those stats show, that people just changing their thinking about thinking actually made a difference. They didn't approach chemistry as, oh, dear God, what is going to happen today when I go into the tests? Oh, oh, look at that book. One of the things that Mel Robbins wrote about is that whenever you begin to procrastinate, that moment that you hesitate. So whenever you think about asking that girl out, like you're like, oh. your brain is actually actively working against you. It's saying, no, 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 this could be dangerous. Danger, danger, danger. Right? But what you need to do, according to Mel Robbins and this psychologist that she's worked with, is to actually say five, four, three, two, one, and then go do it without thinking about it. Just stop thinking about it. Just go with your gut. Like, Oh, Ray Orson was a kind of a surrogate granddad to me um, whenever I was growing up, and uh, he told me once, son, if you don't ask her out, she can't ever say yes. And it changed my life. No, I mean, like, it changed my life. Like, I get things, well, I mean, it changed my life in that, like, if you met my wife, you'd be like, yeah, you did. What? She said yes. I'm like, I know, I'm still amazed. <laughs> But it changed my life in that, like, I go to the counter, and everywhere I go, I ask for the nice guy discount. And you know what? About three or four times out of ten, I get a nice guy discount. Of 15 to 20 percent, sometimes employees who have, like, they're checking me out at Chick-fil-A or something, they'll be like, well, I have to use my employee discount today. And they'll give me their employee discount. And I'm like, thanks. Now, that may not be much whenever it's just you, but I have a family of six. 15 percent off a family of six is a lot. That's just an example of like how little things about learning to, to take action whenever, maybe before you're like, oh, that's stupid. Like, what is it? Oh. The moment you begin to think that, according to the five second rule, you're supposed to say, five, four, three, two, one, take action. Five, four, three, two, one. Everybody say, five, four, three, two, one. And you do it. So it's like whenever I say, 
I'd like everybody to stand up and move to the center of the row. Do it. Go. Okay, stop. <laughs> but do you see all of that hesitation? Did you feel it? They're like, is he serious? Like, I'm all comfortable here. Like, oh, and I have to sit next to him? Her? Or, oh, man. Like, you know, I, I'm, I picked this seat out in particular, back at the back or in the front. Like, you're going to make me... But there's this certain aspect of you don't trust me because you don't know what else I'm going to make you do if you start doing stuff I told you to. Right? And so you're like, oh, I'm going to resist. What is it whenever you're telling you something to do? You're saying, I want to go work out. Or you're saying, I want to go and study that. I want to, I need to, I better, I should. And you tell yourself, I, I should. I really should stop eating these potato chips and turn off the Xbox and get up out of my chair and go and pick up my book and call my friend. And, well, change the channel, change the channel, change the channel. What are you doing? Where are you? What? And what she says is one of the most important things for you to do is to recognize that the energy of beginning is often far more than the energy to actually deliver. It's that activation energy. It's a concept from chemistry. Like to catalyze a reaction, to get it started, actually requires more pressure to, to snap. It requires more pressure than the force in which my finger hits to make the noise. I have to push way harder against myself to make the noise, just to snap, y'all snap? You feel the pressure between your fingers? Y'all know how to snap? Right? It's way harder to learn to whistle than it is to actually do it. Right? It took me way longer to learn how to do that, but you know what? I can call my kids from anywhere in the playground and they know it. it's time to come. The energy to get started is often the hardest part, but after you cross that threshold, and sometimes it's just a matter of having a different ritual. You all know what rituals are, right? So when we think about thinking, we put into place rituals like five, four, three, two, one. Will you go out with me on a date? No. no, no. Thank you. I'm just serious. I'm just using this as an example. I'm not hitting on anybody here. I don't want anybody to think about it. Five, four, three, two, one. Pick up the book, open to chapter three. No. Sometimes it's just giving yourself a ritual, giving yourself something that you do whenever you start to say, well, I could go to the, but you need, I want everybody to stand up and move to the center, and you all go, I want you to go five, four, three, two, I'm gonna look stupid, I don't care, and you move. You see how it goes? It's way different. So everybody at least stand up. Ready? Five, four, three, two, one, stand. Now was that hard? Yes. No. Now if I ask you to move anywhere yeah. in the room, now that you've actually gotten up, how much energy is required from him? Not much. Right? The energy of getting out the chair was the first bit. All right. Everybody sit back down. See, so y'all didn't even hesitate about that one. All right. To be aware of the type of learning that you're doing is going to make all of the difference. So, I want you to be aware of the type of learning that you're doing. In the next 45 seconds, I want you to count all of the vowels. Everybody knows what a vowel is. Remember, right? Like, I know it's been a while since you did elementary school, but A-I-O-U. I'll put them up there just in case. Right? Now I'm going to put a list of words up on the 15 words, I think. Yeah, 15 words. I'm going to put 15 words on there, and I want you to count all of the vowels in those 15 words. Are you ready? Here we go. You write down your number on your index card so you can't cheat. <laughs> Are you aware of the type of learning that you're doing? 
five, four, three, two, one. Good. Now the test is this. How many words do you remember of the 15? Write them all down. Go. <laughs> Go ahead. Write down the word. Y'all have index cards? Oh. Can you get them some index cards and pins and stuff? Write down the words. It, the pin doesn't work. Write it with a highlighter. You're fancy. I believe you. How many words? Who's got the most? You write that word? Oh, you didn't get an index card? Seriously. Did you get sunglasses and a poncho too? No. Oh, you better get ponchos. That's what's in those red balls, by the way. If you open it, the poncho pops out. You'll need it someday when the rainstorm comes. Always does in your baseball season. It's amazing. Anybody raise their hand? Didn't get an index card, please? Or Thank you. Need a pen. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Do you need a pen? Anybody depend? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so who got the most words? How many? Come on. Two words? <laughs> four. Okay, four. Two, four. How many did you get? Two. Two. You can remember two. One. You can remember one word off of 15. Now, how many vowels were there? 50. Uh -huh. But you know what? It doesn't matter how many vowels there were because that was not the test. Are you ready to do it again? This time, I want you to pay attention to the order of the list. Hint, it's not an alphabetical list. Now, how many words can you remember now? Shout them out. What was number one? Oh. Number two? Nice. Number three? Nice. Number four? Nice. Number five? Yeah. Number six? six number seven? Nice. Number eight? Nice. Number nine? Nice. Number ten? Nice. Number eleven? Number 12, uh -huh. number uh, 12 and number 13, number 14, number 15, quarter hour, quarter hour is 15 minutes. Oh, they say, what? Wait a minute, I didn't even see the pattern, I didn't even notice. Yeah, but see, isn't it amazing that you went from one to 15? I mean, like, collectively, one, two, two, four, two. Like, we might have hit six after the first round. But by giving you a strategy, by giving you, by, by bringing, calling your attention to some detail about the information, and then you actually recognize that it's a competition that you sucked at the first time, and not wanting to lose after the first time, you suddenly stepped up to a whole other level, didn't you? So what was the difference between the first time and the second time? There were two big differences. First, we knew what the task was. I gave you a job. You were looking at the data, weren't you? You're sitting there like, I can count some vowels. A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, I, O, U. Oh, don't count the Y, because it feels like an I, but it's not. Oops. Right? And you were working hard at it. And even then, all of you didn't get the same answer. But it didn't matter because you were aiming at the wrong target. And you hadn't stopped to think, is this a trick question? Is this guy just standing up there front? Is he trying to do something else? What else am I supposed to be looking at when I look at these words? What am I seeing? Why are those words there? What? He's talking about learning. He's talking about thinking about thinking. I said twice to you, I want you to think about what you're doing in the process, I want you to think about how you're thinking. And how many of you let go of it and ran to the A? You were like, the A is how many vowels there are. I'm going to get that A. I'm going to make that grade. But 
but you fail to remember that we're in a presentation about doing it different. We're in a presentation about metacognition. We're in a presentation where you need to back up and go, oh, I see something funky there. Okay, I'm going to count some vowels, but that's funny. Look at all those words. They're like numbery words. Right? Knowing what the task is matters, but also knowing how the information is organized matters too. Now, do we know this information in thermodynamics? Do we know how the information is organized in sociology? Do we know how the information is organized when it's presented to us directly? Or do we need to begin to make sense of how it's organized in order to remember that? Would it be helpful to us to stop and look at how it's organized, at what it is they're trying to teach, at this, the house that they're trying to build? How many of you have ever built a house? Oh, yeah. Okay, so I have to have for you minute. You did actually build a house. All right. Now, so you don't care. Excuse me. Now, how many of you can tell me all the parts of a house, more or less? Like the general components. Like what's at the bottom? And what's on the sides? And what's in the walls? Insulation and windows. Yeah. I like to plug stuff in. You've been around it enough, right? That you you have this sense of like, yeah, well, I know all of those things. But if I make you go through and describe how to build a house from the ground up, you could pull out a piece of paper and you could come up with a list of probably two or three hundred different aspects of a house just by thinking through it because you know how a house is organized. You have you can think through the framework. You can start at the bottom and you can say, oh, that builds on this, oh, that builds on this, oh, that builds on this. I think there's something under my laminate floor. I think there is because I've seen it picking out of there or I saw them put it down. Oh, it's an under laminate. It sits on top of the concrete. I don't know what it does. I have no idea why they put it there, how much it costs. But I, I know that it's there. I've seen it. And I can stop and think about it. Now, if it's a pop quiz and you have 15 seconds and you only have to name five, and you're like, shingles, bricks, windows, doors, concrete. Right? But if you're in the world of needing to build a house, then you're thinking, ooh, concrete footer. Concrete plumbing. Oh, plumbing in the concrete. Maybe you're like here in the house, so you're like, ooh, it doesn't have concrete. It's just like crazy, like bricks and stuff. I don't even know how it's working. See where I'm going? But you can break it down and think about it in terms of the way that it's organized, and it gives you a whole host of different information. It allows you to recall stuff in your brain that you didn't even remember was there. Okay? This is going to be key for you as you move forward to think about how the information is organized if you want to ret return on it. So, Think aloud exercises. You say, whenever you're about, uh, about to, to do an assignment or about to study something in a, in a book, like a, a chapter, you need to do some think aloud exercises. You're going to stop and say, hmm, I wonder why I'm doing this. I wonder how this connects to what we learned yesterday. I wonder how this sets up the foundation for what the overall learning outcome is for this class. How do I know what the overall learning outcome is for the class? Because it's printed on the syllabus that they give you on day one. It says learning outcomes. Student will be able to something, 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 something. Student will be able to do something, something, something as evidenced by something, something. Go look, go look at your syllabi. They all say them. They all tell them. Whenever you look at your assessments, they all are supposed to help prove evidence that you can do those things. You can learn those things. You can describe those things. You can analyze those things. You can evaluate those things. You can create and synthesize and do these kinds of things. Why am I doing this stuff? So you constantly ask yourself why. Why does it matter that, oh, the square root of a negative number, what's a, what's a negative square root? Imaginary number, why does that matter? Who cares? It's imaginary, it's like Puff the Magic Dragon or something, like it's imaginary, right? I'm not talking about drugs. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I saw a movie the other day and they had um, you know, Meet the Parents, I think. Yeah, that's funny. Um, imaginary numbers. Why, are they, why do they matter? Well, because if you're going to do advanced math, you need to be able to break down those numbers and come up with solutions. If you're going to figure out how to get us to the moon, if you're going to figure out um, the complex chemical properties of this new element, if you're going to create 
um, carbon nanofibers, you're going to have to be able to do math that is something overly, entirely different and even requires you to be able to, to multiply two numbers together negatively, which is imaginary. But it's essential that you be able to do it. Otherwise, there are some solutions you can never find. You never have to use the imaginary number except in the process of finding the real solution. But if you don't ask yourself why, then you're like my freshman in high school who's like, why the heck do I have to learn about imaginary numbers? I want to learn about real numbers. I'm like, yes. Actually, funny that you use that. There's a pun in there somewhere. But, you know, like, and it's important that you understand why they matter. Otherwise, learning the processes is never going to actually happen. It's going to go in, and it's going to fly out your head the next second. Right? How many times have you done that studying for finals, and then a semester or two later, somebody in class says, so, I'd like you to actually write down the Pythagorean theorem. And you went, uh, that was really easy. I sure can do that. Oh my goodness, what is it? No? I have a, a seven-year-old, eight-year-old, who can do that now. You know why? Because it's in the Wizard of Oz. The scarecrow quotes it after he gets his diploma. But because it's a movie quote, I have a kid who knows it. <laughs> but it would be far more important to remember why it matters, far, far more valuable to remember why it matters in order to be able to get there. Now, if you move, um, I'm sorry, if you are always testing your understanding by verbalizing or writing about the concepts that you learn, a lot of you aren't going to do this because you're like, oh, that's going to waste my time. That's going to make my study time go beyond 15 minutes. Oh, no. I studied for all 15 minutes and like, Oh, it was just really exhausting to me. I just, it's just, oh, I have no idea. It was terrible. No, 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 no. You're going to put in study time for your classes. And you're going to take some time to actually write down what it mattered, what it meant to you, what did you learn. Whenever you had this learning experience, not just, oh, it was good, or it was bad, or your day was fine, dad. But you're going to write down something about it that was meaningful. Why? How will this matter in the future? And suddenly you'll remember that. It will become more memorable. You write it down in a journal, like a diary, and then you look back later whenever you feel frustrated at how far you've come. And those of you who have said in the past, I will never be good at something, will never be able to say it again, because you'll look back at that journal, and you will hear your own words tell you what you did learn, and you will see how far you have come, and you will go, huh, wow, maybe I need to stop and think about myself a little bit differently. Maybe I need to have a metacognitive moment about this whole learning enterprise, my capacity, my potential, and the limitations that others have placed on me that were entirely untrue. Maybe that was what you needed. Maybe you need to hear your voice telling you the truth about how awesome you are and the great potential that you have. Because your voice is going to be the one that at the end of it all, you'll be able to stay, step back and look in the mirror and be like, hey, wow, I was the dummy from second period who was never going to make it past eighth grade. Wow. I was the kid with the disability who was never going to make it out of that place. Wow. I was the kid who, I was the narcoleptic who was never going to be able to stay awake long enough to have a meaningful conversation with people. That was me. But I know how to do it now because I know how to think about myself and about what I'm doing in order to overcome the challenges that face me. And you can do it. If you move your activities higher on Bloom's taxonomy, you will, um, you're going to compare, contrast, think of analogies, come up with new ways, then this will make all the difference for you. This is what you're trying to do when you cram for the test, right? And yeah, okay. Y'all have heard of Bloom's taxonomy before? Like you've heard of it. You've taken an elementary psychology class maybe, like Psych 1300 something. Sometimes people will introduce it in the beginning of their class. We always teach it in rigor ready because it's really important for students to begin to think about what it is that they're doing with their information. If you're just remembering stuff, then you're like, what's the Pythagorean theorem? Uh, the sum of the square of the equal to the sum of the hypotenuse is equal to the square of the other two sides. I, I like, why, why does that matter? Understanding is what we're talking about in terms of constructing something from it. Applying it is what you're going to go and do with it. So what is it, what is it if you really want to learn something that you begin to say, ooh, I think I'm going to build something. I think I'm going to design something. I think I'm going to do a problem. I'm going to create a problem. I think I'm going to stand up and teach it. 
that's going to be that's going to require an evaluation of it, right? I'm going to evaluate. I'm going to look and see what are the different pieces of this matter. How is that going to work together? Making judgments. Ooh, evaluating something because of what you know. How will this uh, thing that I've learned apply to the to a plane wing? Nobody's required me to do that, but I'm going to imagine it. I'm going to imagine it and get it totally wrong, but I'm at least going to try. And then you begin to create because you come up with new things. You come up with new ways of doing things. You begin to invent in your wrongness. You fall forward. Have you ever done that where you like tried something and it was terrible and you just like stumbled forward and all of a sudden like you were at a place that nobody had ever been before? It's really cool. It's really fun whenever you're looking at something and, and people say, oh, this is the way it's done. And you begin to do it differently. I'm putting, I'm wanting, I'm not doing it yet, but putting new floors in our, in our, in our home. What would it look like if I always just cut down trees and glued them to the ground? Right? We'd eventually have no trees, but now we have engineered hardwoods and laminate flooring and vinyl. And who was it that suddenly went, you know what? Cutting down trees is a lot of hard work. We can print that laminate and we can cut it into little, we can roll it out in big rolls. It's called linoleum. They sold it in the 60s and 70s, right? 50s and 60s and 70s. And then somebody's like, you know, it ships a lot easier. We can sell a whole lot more of it. If we don't have to sell it by the roll, we can just sell it in little boxes at Home Depot. What, if, what would it look like if somebody created something new? What would it look like if that somebody was you? Who took the information that you're studying and began to think about creating with it? Moving up the Bloom's taxonomy is not something that just happens by accident. So let me ask you this. At what level did you have to think about whenever you were in high school to make an A or a B? Go ahead, shout it out. What level did you have to be at? One. One. Anybody? One. Okay. What level of plumes do you have to operate to make A's in college? Three, two, four. What level do you have to operate in order to be successful in life, in the workplace, in the work, world of work? Six. Why are you going to wait until you're in the world of work to get started doing this level of thinking? You think you're going to be very good at it if you've never done it until then? Probably a good time to start, yes? So the question becomes, how do you move up Bloom's Ladder? Well, you're going to use the study cycle I'm about to show you, and you're going to do some intense study sessions. Okay? I'm going to describe both. Are you ready? This is the big thing. If you're taking a picture or something with your phone, this is it. This is your big picture. This is what you want to take away. You want to walk away with this. Take a picture of it. Write it down. Think about it. You want to do the study cycle. The study cycle says... This little bit of time you're going to preview before class. Do you know the federal government says that for every hour that you're supposed to be in class, so on a Monday you're in a 50-minute class, right? Let's call that an hour, even though it's not. The federal government anticipates that you're going to spend one full hour actually preparing for that class. Then you're going to go to class for that hour, and then after that class, you're going to do an hour's work of, work of accessible work. So if you're one of those calendar people, what you need to do is look at your calendar and go, do I have my classes on my calendar? If not, you should go to uh, Raider Link and open up banner registration, and there's a little place where you can click it, and it will email you all of your classes for the whole semester, and all you have to do is open it up, and it will magically appear in your calendar. It's amazing. But once you've done that, it's not enough. For each one of those hours of class, you need to build an hour of prep time and an hour of accessible work so that you can see what your full schedule is. So how many hours are you taking this semester? 16. 16. 16 oh, 15. 15 is easy number. It's a good round number. 15. We'll go with that. 15. And an hour of prep is 15 more. And an hour of accessible work is 15 more. So in a given week, you're expected to actually invest 45 hours of work. Now I want you to think about it last semester. How many of you actually invested in intensive study sessions for a full hour before an hour of class and a full hour after the hour of class? How many of you did that consistently? Yeah? What year are you? 
is what are you freshman, sophomore, junior, senior? Junior. Junior. Mm -hmm. What I've generally learned is that people start to figure that out about their junior year. And they start to put it together. And it just makes me wonder, what if everybody started to put that together their freshman year? What would suddenly happen? Previewing before class is a way to do that. Write down three questions about what you're going to do in that class. Right? Write down three questions about sociology. You know, whenever you look at the textbook and it has the text here and then they do the little headlines? That's a great preview. Just write down what you see and then ask yourself thoughtful questions about what might I learn in this paragraph when I read this incredibly boring thing that I don't really want to do because it's one of the basics that I just have to do the thing to do. Five, four, three, two, one. Paraphrase. Paraphrase. Write it down. Go to class. I know that sounds dumb. Like, oh, that's obvious. No, 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 no. Not so obvious. Go. Gotta go. You paid more money to go to class than you did to the movie the last time you went. When was the last time you bought a movie ticket and then stood outside and went, I just don't think I'm going to go? <laughs> movie and popcorn. Right? It's like, how stupid would that be? You're smarter than that. Go to class. It's a great place for you to see if the prep that you did was actually the stuff that you were going to learn in class or if there was something more or if you got it right. Review after class. A lot of people don't do this. They'll be like, oh, I'm done with that. Girl, I'm done. What are you doing today? Well, we're going to play some basketball. That's awesome. Right after you stop and review what it is that you learned. Right after you spend at least part of your hour after class to come back to it. You've got to. You owe it to yourself. Do you want to waste your time? Then your brain needs that moment where you come back to that information because the second time that you look at it, is not the time that you were most likely to remember it. It's the third time, the fourth time, and the fifth time that reinforce it. So you want to make sure that you're looking at any piece of information five times if you want to make sure that you remember it. And how many of you would really like to not have to cram at the end of the semester? Yeah? And you need five times with that information. You need a preview time. You need to go to class and hear it the second time. You need to review it after class. And then in a study where you repeat it, oh look, three to five short study sessions per day. Just short sessions where you ask yourself meaningful questions. It's not, I just read it, I read it. No, 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 ask yourself the who, what, when, where, why. Answer the question, write it down. You can write, type it out if you're like a fast typer. If you're like a thumb person, with the, like put it on your phone, I don't care. Like whatever's the fastest way you type, use emojis and stuff. It doesn't matter what your method is, it matters that you're doing it. It matters that you're thinking about it when you're doing it, that you're not just completing the task. It's not like walking. It's like doing the Dougie. I'm not even going to try to do it. Okay? Like, it's, 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 it's thinking about it. But there's a point in time when you don't think about it anymore. You just know how. Right? That's what you want to do. Assess your learning. Periodically perform reality checks. Do you know that you have the capacity to test you on anything that you need to be tested on before anybody else does? And how much does it matter if you fail your own test? Brilliant. My daughter is doing driver's ed. Are we going to go for the first time to do a driver's test without having talked about it? No. Will she study it? Yes. Are we going to give her a chance to practice it a bunch before she has to do it for real? Of course. You know this. Because about the stuff that you care about, you do this already. So it's kind of like you have to start thinking about it in a way that prompts you to care about it. At another level. Five, four, three, two, one, do it. You see? Now, this intense study session is what I was talking about. So, if you took a picture of this, then you got this right here. Now look at that. Does that look undoable? Really? Is there any part of that that's just like, oh, I can't. I can't make myself. No. See, what I'm going to say is that this part is where I've been focusing most of my presentation right here. Right? But this part's the most fun. Reward yourself. Hey, now you get to go back to that bag of potato chips, right? That Xbox game that you put on hold or whatever. Like, now you come back to it. Not for forever, just for 15 to 15 minutes. You take a break, you call a friend, you do some texting, you check Facebook, you do some Snapchat, whatever is your thing. Okay, you go to do intramurals. Reward yourself, you should. Whatever it is you love. I'm narcoleptic, I like to sleep. <laughs> narcoleptic joke, sorry, no. 
little bit. But like, whatever it is that like is refreshing to you, do that. It's fun. You reward yourself. Don't be dangerous. Don't be illegal. Don't be unethical. But reward yourself. You worked hard. And the crazy thing about your brain is that whenever you do that, it goes, oh, that work that I did was a valuable exercise. Right? You know why? Because at some level, you have this survival brain. When I say, bah! something in you goes, I'm either going to kick his butt or I'm going to run for the hills. We've heard of this before, right? Fight or flight syndrome kind of thing. You have a limbic system in your brain. Like, you want to live. You want to survive. So whenever I come at you in a way that you actually feel threatened, because I hope you didn't really feel threatened. <laughs> but like, whenever I do, there's something in you that goes, because there's a survival mechanism you want to kick in. So you have to figure out how to work hard and then play. All your life, people have said, no, play as much as you can because then people are going to make you work. No, 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 no. You want to make sure that you are able to survive before the bear comes at you. You want to have built the shelter. You want to have been able to be able to protect and provide for yourself, right? School is no different. And so even though you can go play basketball or you can lay in bed for an extra hour or you can, I just don't feel like doing anything. I just want to lay in my bed, right? Like, no, <laughs> you got to get up and get something done. And then you can go lay in your bed because you earned it. You with me? Intensive study sessions using this pattern. Don't forget to come back and review this. Five minutes. You took some notes. You did a little bit of a little set of index cards. Right? Electronic index cards where you're like, you just flip through those. No big deal. And what you'll find is that suddenly that little five minute review, you'll go, <laughs> I got this. And then you know what will happen? The people in your class will notice that instead of making the 50, 60, 68, you're the one making the 80, 85, 90. And they'll be like, dang, how did you get a copy of the test early? How you been cheating? I'm like, no. No, 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 no. You have been cheating yourself to not work like I have been working. Let me show you how it's done. And you'll show them how to not cheat themselves out of the education that they're paying for and investing in, supposedly. Fair enough? You got a picture of this, everybody. This is the stuff. If you got nothing else, that was it. All right. There's a whole lot of strategies. Go look up metacognitive strategies, learning, Google that stuff. You can see it. You can pull it up and be like, oh. But this like giving many lectures on concepts, what does it look like to do a lecture in the mirror? Right? Like, how stupid is that? Do it. Try it. Make a fool of yourself. Get your study group together and be like, today, I'm going to teach you how to find the area under a curve. They'll be like, right, you? <laughs> okay, today I'm gonna do, I'm gonna speak only in Spanish. Right? And they'll be like, <laughs> go for it. Let's see that happen. And then you make yourself. And suddenly you find out that Spanish won and won quite as hard as you thought it was because you have been prepping yourself for that. You've been thinking about not looking like a fool. You've been thinking about how to make yourself more successful. Intense study sessions. The learning center is the place that you want to go learning comments. Aiming for 100% and not 90 is an incredibly important point. If you aim for 90%, you're probably going to hit it. So start aiming for 100, right? Shoot for the moon so you can land in the stars. I don't know what the metaphor is for you. I don't know what the cliche is that you will appreciate. But if you raise the bar above what it is you thought you could do, you're likely to do it. So here we go. Was this you last term? Did any of those apply to you last term? Yeah. Five, four, three, two, one. Do it, right? Five, four, three, two, one. I'm going to touch the material. I'm going to open that textbook that I spent $130 on. I'm going to open it like I love it, like it is somebody I'm going to marry, because it's cost me $130. When was the last time you spent $130 on something and didn't use it? Okay? I'd say it was probably last semester. I started my homework too late. 
Oh my gosh, you have a phone with a calendar. You go to the bathroom and sit on the toilet and play with your phone. Calendar your time. You don't have to start too late. But whenever that calendar alarm goes off that you set that said you're going to study for that long, then you 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, get up and go do it, right? You don't be like, oh, well, I'll just snooze that alarm, I'll snooze that alarm. No, 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 you just turn off the snooze feature, you see? You with me? I didn't memorize the information I needed to. Well, we've already covered that. The, it, it, memorization isn't the thing we want to do. We want to learn to use it. We want to do something with it. We want to create something. We want to imagine it in use. I didn't use the book. I heard that. I assumed I understood information that I had read and reread, but did not apply. You know what they say about assuming, right? Okay. Now, how many of you think that this might be you this semester? Could this be you? Is it within your power? Is it in your, under your control to do these things? That, go back to that screen that I had to take a picture of. Is it within your control to do this? So is there ever a time that you should gripe about that professor who didn't tell you that you needed to know that thing for the test? No. No. You are the CEO of your own company. You are in charge. You're the boss. It's not me. The most important person in the room is you. Jesus is you. So whenever Jesus wakes up in the day, he's going to look at these things and say, did I do these things? And if he doesn't do those things, he's going to fire himself. No, wait, that's not work. That doesn't work at all, does it? But you need to recognize that your full-time paycheck comes from your full-time effort to do these things that you have the capacity to do. And the beautiful part is that you get to be in a community of people that are all seeking to do these things together. So you don't just have to do them by yourself. You pick up the 54321 phone and you call somebody. If you don't know somebody to call, you call Corey Powell and say, Corey, I don't know who to call. And he will say, oh, well, come see me. We'll go out and show you something. I can see you. Like, come on. Because <laughs> that's what he does whenever I say, I don't know how to do that. He's like, well, you come on. We'll figure it out. That's, that's what we do. Right? That was my best Corey Powell. Did that do it? No. <laughs> <laughs> So, in 2013, this was what an engineering professor said. Engineering professor in class said, I'm going to stop. I'm tired of seeing all you people fail. And did this presentation. Pretty much what I just gave you. The same strategy showed that exact same thing I told you to take a picture of. And said, students who did not use the survey of the students. How many of you didn't use the strategies? And they were honest and said, blah, blah. How many of you used the strategies? Yeah. These are students just like you. What's stopping you from having the green be your number as opposed to the red? Five, four, three, two, one. I'll let y'all read it. Look, what do you see? What sticks out of you? Now some of your numbers people jump to this. That's fine. That proves that it was worth doing. But do you see what they have to do? Thinking about getting better doesn't make anybody better. It just makes you feel more sad that you aren't better. Who wants to be depressed? No, 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 no. We're going to 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, get up and go do it. If we want to accomplish our goals. You see? Nobody's making you except you because you're the boss. Those are the strategies. That's them. So, what can you do to pursue your 4.0 this semester? What is your GPA right now for this semester? What is it? Your term GPA this semester is not defined. You see? It has not yet been set. It comes. Now, there are some people who say your GPA is zero. Right now. There's some people who say your GPA right now is 4.0. Those are people who would argue about whether the glass is half full or half empty, wouldn't they? Right? My point is that it has not yet been determined what your GPA is. 
And the opportunity that you have to use these strategies is to make the grade is going to do more than just making the grade. It's going to help you learn and grow and become someone who can use the information that you invested your time in. This is what I recommend that you do. You taking a picture of that? This is my challenge to you. This is my dare to you. Is anybody going to jump in on this? I dare you to do this. Anybody? Take the challenge? Sure. I bet that you will make a higher GPA this semester than you did last semester. And if you don't, then you're the one who won't benefit, right? But when you do, I will buy you dinner. If you're on the sign-in sheet for this presentation and you have a better GPA this term than you did last term because you did these strategies that we talked about and you journal about your experiences, if you're doing this, you put stuff on your calendar, you invest the time, when you make better than the GPA you made last semester, I'm going to take you to dinner. Deal? You didn't know you were going to get dinner out of it, did you? <laughs> now, see, the thing is, I've already budgeted for all of you, actually 40 people, to go to dinner because I anticipate there will be 40 people to here tonight. Because I'm so confident, I told my boss, I'm going to have to pay for dinner for 40 people. And I'm going to have no money in my own, so I'm like, my department's going to pay for me. Okay? I already budgeted for it because it was important. And not just because it's important but because it's possible. Now, I want you to finish this process by writing down which of the one strategies you're going to do within the next 48 hours. Because the first thing that we're going to do is not hesitate. We're going to take action by making a decision right now. You make a decision and write it down on that index card that is for you only. And remember, the reason that I have you write the vowel number on, and the words on that card is because that was the point of the presentation where I said, if you have a strategy, you can do better. If you think about how you're learning, you can do better than if you don't think about it. Right? Good. So, on that same card that reminds you that the vowels versus the word, the 15 words that you memorized, that's the strategies point. Write down the strategy that you're going to put into place, and then 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, get up and get it done. So what if you said this, I'm so committed to buying you dinner, what if you were committed to it too? What if you said, I believe that we're going to have an average GPA of this people in this room using these strategies, I believe that we're going to have a GPA of 3.4. Term GPA, 3.4. You think it's doable? And nobody in the room with a GPA less than 3.0. That means everybody would be making all A's and B's this semester. Are you committed to try for A's and B's this semester? To aim for A's and be okay if you make a B or two? Are you good with that? I mean, it's a whole other level of goal setting, isn't it? Whenever somebody says, oh, just do your best. No, 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 no. I'm saying A's and B's. Because you have the capacity to do this. And I've given you the tools to be able to accomplish it. What if you said, yes, we will? Will you say that? Awesome. Well, say it then. All right, you heard it here. That's going to require your commitment to each other and your commitment to yourself. You deserve it. I believe it. I know you have it in you. And I wish you a fantastically successful future. But I know that it's going to be you that's going to make it happen. My wishes are good sentiments sent your way. But y'all, you can do this. And I look forward to celebrating with you at your graduation. Thank you very much for your time. Please give another hand to Mr. Dr. Barron. Complete the um, evaluations for us. Just a couple of real quick announcements. On Thursday, we have our um, Better You series kicking off, as was shared in the announcements, is really designed 
This three-part series is going to look at your you improvement and getting into the better you physically, uh, mentally, and spiritually, um, holistically, really. So, first one is this Thursday um, in the edu education, education basement. basement. Mm -hmm. We'll look at your body, and then later in the semester, we have the other uh, two parts of that series. On Monday, um, we have our first study session of the semester. It's a free opportunity for you to get some tutorial assistance in our office and utilize the strategies that we share with you tonight. Um, Tuesday is, uh, what's Tuesday's event, Let Tuesday's event is, I know Wednesday is the library, utilizing the library. I forgot what Tuesday is. You should get calendars. We have calendars out there. Um, we, we emailed all this information out to you. On the 15th of February for African American History Month, we have the African American History Month lecture series kicking off. Anita Hill is a pioneer um, in terms of uh, rights and for equality and uh, laws and placed on the federal books regarding, the federal laws that were put on the books regarding sexual harassment rights and so forth. And then on the 26th of February, we have Dr. Michael Eric Dyson coming. This is all that information. The tickets are available. They are free in our office. What's Tuesday the event? It's the Business Law and Graduate School Informational. So if uh, continuing your education here at Texas Tech is something that's uh, something that you want to do, please come to that because we're going to have present, uh, presenters from each of those schools do a main talking point, and then they're going to break out, and you can go and get more in-depth information on the specific school that you want to apply to. All that information is emailed out to you. Please take your trash, Richie. Thank you so much. Have a great night. <laughs> Make sure you get your evaluation to one of the pack members that's in the party. Okay.